I'm Richard Dodd, and you're listening to the Ecology Academy podcast. This is a show where we get to talk and learn about all things ecological, including interviews with top ecologists, both employers and employees, those working with ecologists, and also aspiring and inspiring career-seeking individuals setting out to make a difference. The show aims to provide you with insights, advice, and inspiration to help you succeed and excel as an effective ecologist and to make a real difference to our natural environment. Welcome to the new season of the Ecology Academy podcast. I'm Richard Dodd, your host, and this month, October, we start with a brand new show. So uh, what the difference is? Well, we're going to be introducing you to some great ecologists, people who are actually actively involved in their expertise in their field of um, ecology. And we start this month with Paul Lossy. Now, Paul... In this podcast, what you'll hear is an introduction to what the UK Habitat Classification System is, um, why we're using it, key features of the UK Habitat Classification System, so primary habitat, secondary codes, the hierarchical part of the UK Hab um, um, itself, looking about the resources, where you can download those information from, and uh, I'll put up on show notes um, the links to there within this podcast itself. We also look, I mean, Paul's very honest in this interview. We know he also looks at the sort of a, the disadvantages of using this new UK classification system for habitats. Um, so as well as the advantages, you know, we're entering a digital world. And so the previous classification system, the phase one habitat survey, for instance, was very much set many years ago. I mean, most people remember using those. I certainly do using those good coloured beryl pencils to actually colour things in on our maps and we, it wasn't intended for the purpose we use it for now, which is as ecological consultants for planning and development. And some of the priority habitats, for instance, aren't within there. You know, we lose a bit of resolution there. So the UK habitat classification system is being designed, and Paul isn't part of the design team. You know, he doesn't work for UK Hab. He's not a director of there. Um, so you know, this is more of a practitioner's view. So Paul gives his honest opinion about. Um, the advantages of using this system and also some of the disadvantages and as because it's a new system and hopefully you know it will improve and we'll get there to actually a fantastic system but with any new system there's always going to be some teething problems and look at also right towards the end so the um, take-home messages from this will be what you can do to take you know take away from from the end of this podcast what you can do to actually go ahead and learn put in its application the UK habitat classification system what sort of what what do you need to do straight away after listening to this podcast so stay tuned to that itself and what you'll find from this new season is that these podcasts are a lot shorter and giving you action uh, so they are, let's say, uh, shorter than they, we had done previously and more focused upon uh, making sure that you can get something out from this podcast straight away you can actually go out and deliver something so you can actually work upon your your skills your knowledge and understanding so without further ado let's hear from paul lossie hi there welcome to the ecology academy podcast now today i have the honor with uh, introducing you to paul lossie so good morning paul hi there hi hi richard yeah how are you doing I'm fine, thank you very much. Excellent, excellent. Now, we're going to be talking uh, about the UK Habitats Classification System. But before we do that, um, perhaps we need to introduce yourself then, Paul. So, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, the, the company you work for. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, I, I'm a self-employed uh, ecological consultant. I've been self-employed for about the last 10, 11 years now. Um, previous to that, I worked for Natural England and, uh, of course, English Nature before that. Um, so that, that's, that's me, really. I am, my main interests are in habitat survey and mapping, and I get involved in GIS mapping quite a lot as well. So that's, that's kind of my main interest, really, and, and, and botany as well, of course. You host our QGIS course as well, don't you? Our introduction to uh, QGIS for consultant ecologists yes that uh yes that's right that's uh, uh, a recent addition i think to your um uh, to your offering indeed but we're not here to talk about that today um we're here to talk about um the uk habitat classification system so i mean um i could i can play the sort of and, and rightly so i can play the sort of um innocent party here so as someone who knows a little bit about um, the uk habitat classification system so 
perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what it is and why it was set up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think first of all, I should say that I've got no connection with UK Hab Limited. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be saying is going to be my my own views and my own own opinion. Um, I did have some uh, a sort of minor involvement in the development uh, of UK Hab in its very early stages, um, as I was on a sort of a, a panel just to give a little bit of feedback right at the beginning. But I don't currently have any involvement with the system at all. Okay. Um, so the, the, these are really just my views and opinions about the system. Having used it a little bit now, um, so, so as a, as an active practitioner, basically. Then. Yes, that's I, yeah. I, I guess that's right. Um, I've uh, yeah. I, I've sort of started putting it into practice over the last uh, two or three years now. So I've got some views about how well it works and maybe some of the the um, pitfalls as well, which which we can talk about. But I think it's. Uh, I think your first question was uh, why it was introduced. Um, and to, to look at that, I think we need to look at a bit of history um, because the habitat uh, classification system that most people have, uh, have been using in the past or, or, or are still using um, is the, the phase one um, habitat survey, mm -hmm. uh, which is very familiar to most ecologists these days. So we have to look at um, a, a little bit about a little bit of phase one and, and think about why that was designed and, and why it was originally came into being. Um, and actually this was, um, phase one was actually designed as a, a, a county-wide survey. So it was for surveys that were going to be carried out um, at, at, you know, um, very large scales. Um, and for example, in the, if you have a look at the phase one survey handbook, they talk about using uh, maps at a scale of one to twenty-five thousand or one to ten thousand. That's what they recommend. Um, and what what we've done is we've taken a survey that was designed for these very big county-wide surveys, and we're we're adapting it. We've adapted it to use for um, a completely different purpose. So we're using phase one for. Um, planning applications and development sites at uh, a completely different scale, a much larger scale, if you like. Um, so we've had to adapt it. And, and also, if you have a look at the phase one survey handbook, most of the methods are, are, are completely out of date. Um, so for, I was having a look at it this morning. It's quite interest, interesting that these they refer to using a specific type of colored pencil yes. uh, to color in the maps, which uh, <laughs> uh, some of us may remember. Um, so it really is out of date. It was designed for a different purpose and it's out of date. And actually, if you look at the first 50, sorry, the first 33 pages of the handbook, most of that's irrelevant now and, uh, and completely out of date. And yeah. also, phase one was designed well before the days, of, before the era, era of GIS. So, um, you know, we've really moved on for it now, from it. But people are still using phase one. Um, clients are still asking for phase one surveys to be to, to be carried out. So it's it it's still in use, but it's out of date. It's very much in the it's in the parlance, isn't it? That's um you know we, we do get requested for undertaking you know phase one habitat surveys. You know that's what they some of our clients request. And, and but it's even same from um, even some of the local authorities as well, local planning authorities. Uh, maybe they're ecologists there, or maybe not an ecologist, but certainly um, an advisor, environmental advisor there. Um, so it's it's yeah. So it's the, so we've got uh, historical context. So I've been, I also remember using phase one and I also remember borrowing those beryl pencils um, yes. when I was with the Countryside Council for Wales, now Natural Resources Wales, going out and doing these surveys. So it's historical um, it was before sort of GIS came on board. So now it's 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 sort of, pro, you know, we, we've got we, um, a new systems coming to take its well, place. Is that yes, right I or think, not? I, I think it's reach, starting to reach the end of its lifespan as well. It's also worth mentioning that there are some particular problems with phase one, not just about it being out of date, um, which, which does cause us problems. So, for example, the habitat definitions in the handbook um, are very brief and can be quite ambiguous as well. Um, for example, there aren't enough indicator species, and they don't really describe the full range of variation for different habitats. Um, 
One of the other key problems is that phase one doesn't separate out priority habitats, um, which which is really important. So mm -hmm. a good example of that would be lowland dryas of grassland, which is a priority, ha a BAP habitat in, in old language, but a habitat of principal importance uh, for, 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 uh, for England. Um, that's actually in phase one, that's actually lumped together with upland acid grassland as well, which isn't a priority habitat. Um, another good example probably would be reed bed, another priority habitat, particularly for it's important for, for a range of breeding birds. Um, but that's lumped in together with swamp, so a much broader definition. So when you're classifying habitats using phase one, you're not drawing out those uh, habitats which are particularly important and I think that's a key a key problem with uh, with phase one <clears throat> and quite interestingly there was a 1999 study carried out which looked at the reliability of phase one habitat mapping um, and it compared the classification and mapping of the same area carried out by six different experienced ecologists um, and the agreement between the maps from the six different ecologists was only 25%. Right. Um, so these were experienced people, yeah. and it was purely down to their interpretation of the habitat definitions in the handbook. Um, and, and that's partly just because they've, in some cases, they're quite vague, and it doesn't, it doesn't give you enough information. So it, it all becomes very subjective. Um, and I think that's a, a, another problem with phase one. So it's it's out of date. It was designed for a different purpose. The habitat definitions are a bit vague and a bit weak. Um, and every, so everybody's adapted phase one in their own ways. And there's a lack of consistency between um, surveyors. And, and that, that causes a whole range of problems. So as you said, we've <clears throat> a new system really is needed at this stage. Uh, and this UK habitat classification system has been developed. And, and I think it does deal with quite a few of those issues. Um, it's a fairly new system, so there are still going to be um, teething problems. And it's, it, it's I, I, I think it's fair to say it's still in development and a new, uh, a new version will be coming out shortly. But it does offer some key advantages over, over phase one, um, particularly in that the habitat definitions provided are, are a lot more comprehensive and I think um, reduces that element of subjectivity. Okay, so they're, they're um, more to, aligned. To, yep. Sorry, Paul. So they're more aligned to sort of the, you know, these priority habitats then. Is, is that uh, one of the key features of the, the, this, uh, the UK habitat classification system? Yeah, so absolutely. So you can pick out the, the key habitats. So um, uh, lowland dry as the grassland, uh, using that example that we had before, um, is identifiable within the uh, within the uh, UK, UK UK habitat classification system or or UK hab as people tend to call yeah. it. Um, so that's separated out from upland acid grassland and the same with reed bed. That other example we gave, and there are quite a few other examples of that. So that's a that's a key thing. <clears throat> One of the key features uh, uh, which. Um, is a, is a really good selling point for UK Hab is that it's hierarchical, mm -hmm. so you can actually classify um, classify habitats at different levels depending on your needs or in, uh, depending on your skill set as well. Um, so you've got five different levels within this hierarchy, and you can actually survey to whichever level is appropriate. So, so I think it, it, sorry, go ahead. No, so, so yeah, absolutely. So I think this is part of, you know, so you know, we're talking about a classification system of habitats and therefore a key part of that is clearly the, your, your botanical skills, you know. So, um, you know, before it was um, a case of, um, you know, we, we, there's probably little training or little competency level, should we say, for botanical survey. So we're, do, do you think this will actually aid or help people improve the botanical skills then? Um, yes, I think so. And I, I think tied into that is that there's a greater need for habitat survey now that um, uh, biodiversity net gain calculations are on the horizon where there'll be a requirement in, for, for most certainly larger developments, there'll be mm. a requirement for, um, the, you know, 
um, actually calculating biodiversity net gain. And a prerequisite for that is obviously carrying out um, a survey. And the UK habitat classification system actually underpins uh, the biodiversity net gain. Um, it is possible to carry out a phase one survey and convert it to uh, a UK hab, but it, it makes sense to actually start start there. Starting and obviously, to, to carry out those sorts of surveys, you do need a certain level of botanical knowledge and, and, and field skills, absolutely. So I think that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's something that um, consultants are certainly going to have to think about is upskilling their staff in that in that area absolutely yeah. um, where, whereas probably the emphasis has been on protected species um, and that that's hopefully going to remain um, but I think the the level of um, you know habitat uh, you know habitat survey and botanical skills is going to have to be um, improved yeah. generally across the board as well. Yeah, I think you know, it's. I mean, I, mean, I deal with a, a couple of universities, and um, you know, previously they've you know they've, they've uh, they include botanical work, but most students and and this is I did a zoology degree, and I can you know, contest to this that uh, yeah, you know, we, we sort of shied away literally from any for the botanical side because it was you know it is it is difficult, it's challenging, but um, I think that the, the the support, the training out there has certainly improved if not become you know a lot more um, accessible than it was you know, particularly back in you know 20 30 years ago yeah absolutely it's interesting to note that i don't think um any universities currently offer a botany degree anymore um which mm. is you know is, is quite telling really um I, I believe there's one botanical msc offered by reading university um I can't think of any others. Perhaps, perhaps there are, but yeah, um, yeah zoology seems to be a, a lot more popular among uh, uh, undergraduates. It, it is. I, I, hopefully, yes. that'll change a little bit. Yeah. So, so sorry, I cut you off there, but you you mentioned about the different sort of hierarchical elements of the <clears> UK have. Yeah. So th there are these five different levels, starting from a sort of very broad level, which is uh, um, uh, sort of level one is the the biome, which is a sort of the, I suppose the major ecosystems, uh, terrestrial, freshwater, or marine. So you're not, you're probably not, you know, that that's probably too broad for most people. But that sets the framework for mm -hmm. it. Um, level two um, starts narrowing it down a bit, so it will it will be the major eco, uh, so the major major ecosystem types uh, at a very high level. So you know, just grassland, woodland, heathland, scrub, wetland cropland, urban, um, uh, rivers and lakes, you know, and, and that sort of very broad, broad level. Um, and then you move down to level three, and this is where we start getting to the level where people might, uh, might actually survey to level three. Um, so uh, these would be, uh, level three, I suppose, is equivalent to the broad habitats that people are fam familiar with. Um, you know, where where um, you'll split, for example, grassland down into acid grassland, mm -hmm. calcareous grassland and neutral grassland. So it might be possible um, if you just wanted a broad overview of a site just to survey down to that level, uh, level three. And all you would have to do is say, well, this is a neutral grassland and um, and that's it, yeah. which, is, which is interesting. Um, and then level four is taking things a little bit further, and that's where we start identifying our priority habitats. So um, if you take uh, the example that we used earlier, acid grassland, you'd break it down into lowland dry acid grassland, which is your, your, your priority habitat, um, upland acid grassland, bracken, um, mm -hmm. which is usually associated with acid grassland. Um, and they've also got another category, other lowland acid grassland, which is sort of mops up anything else that doesn't fall into those those categories. Um, so that's um, that's level four, and um, I guess most people are going to survey down to at least level three or level four. Yeah. Um, level five, um, the most detailed level of the survey, <clears throat> um, is really taking things into you know into more detail and this is where you would identify annex one habitats for example so annex one habitats are those habitats that are of 
um, European importance. So uh, an example would be, um, you know, dry acid grassland, uh, or sorry, dry dry glass grasslands on chalk or limestone, which are important orchid sites. So that's a, 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 just an example of an Annex 1 habitat. And that would be um, a subdivision of lowland calcareous grassland. But here, what you're doing is you're highlighting um, this important European habitat as well. So would that be comparable uh, to, I mean, we've heard, you know, talk about, um, you know, phase one, but... Um, um, one thing we haven't mentioned so far is the national vegetation classification, um, so NVC. Um, yeah. You know, is, so, is, is level five equivalent to that? Or level uh, four? No, NVC no. is probably more detailed, mm -hmm. I would suggest. Um, and NVC takes a different approach altogether, really. So um, it's all about vegetation. NVC is all about vegetation communities. Um, and obviously, NVC is used um, for development sites, for example, um, particularly where an important habitat has been um, identified. But again, NVC doesn't necessarily identify priority habitats or um, Annex 1 habitats. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have to know what you're talking about. And NVC does require that much of a higher level of botanical, of a higher botanical skill set. So it, it, it's more detailed than level five of um, of the UK have, so it's right. it's a different beast, really. Yeah. Great. Thank so you. what what um, what the the UK have what the UK habitat classification is doing is it's um, giving you the option to to describe habitats and classify habitats and map habitats at a greater level of detail than you would be able to in phase one, if you wish to do so, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a very useful thing to be able. To, uh, to be able to do for people. Okay, and in terms of um, so that's the hierarchical, hierarchical system. And in terms of um, how how is this manifest itself? So what sort of um, I suppose resources are there out there which can be used by um, you know um, us as ecologists? Yeah, so um, UK Hab actually produce a whole variety of resources which are really useful, and you can download um, you can download these. Um, resources from their website free of charge you just have to register um, so the sorts of things that they uh, sorts of things that they have available are um, a really quite detailed um, handbook of uh, habitat definitions so a lot more detailed than um, the, the phase one habitat survey handbook for example so they'll give you a comprehensive list of species and um, you know, really help you to uh, pin down your classification um, with, yeah, a, a, I think a greater deal of certainty than you would have been able to do so before. Um, they also provide a field key. Mm -hmm. So if you're out in the field, um, you can actually work out the habitat, <clears throat> which habitat you've got in front of you just by working through a key, which I think is extremely useful. That's also available as, as an app uh, as well. Um, they offer a useful spreadsheet which breaks down um, the different classifications and um, uh, what else? Uh, yeah, uh, there's a really useful user manual as well because there are all sorts of um, issues that people need to consider when they're carrying out uh, a survey. Like for a, a good one would be, how do you deal with transitions between habitats? How do you deal with mosaics? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, those sorts of things... Uh, we dealt with uh, in phase when people were using a phase uh, or carrying out a phase one survey, um, people would just come up with their own solutions, which of course leads to inconsistency between surveyors. So um, different people would deal with mosaics in in in, in different ways. Um, whereas with UK Hab, they actually provide some guidance on how you deal with some of those difficult situations in the field so that's that's very useful yeah the one i always um, struggled with was um when it came to you know ephemeral short perennial um sort of habitats. Yes. that's yes. That, that's the one I'm thinking all oh, right what does actually actually mean <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, i been... think that's still a difficult one as well <laughs> but yeah absolutely the, the one thing that we haven't mentioned um uh, though yet is that um in addition to those uh the, that hierarchy that we've been talking about there's uh, what they call the, the the primary habitats they also offer an option to 
add in uh, secondary codes. So there are a whole list of um, a whole list of secondary codes in different categories, which allow you to add information. So if you're out in the field and you're you're mapping and you you um, map an area of um, of grassland, for example, um, and you want to say a little bit more about that grass and you can add in codes. So for example, if there are scattered trees mm -hmm. within your grassland, you would map the habitat as um, grassland and use one of the secondary codes to indicate that there are scattered trees present. Um, uh, there are secondary codes that allow you to add information about the history of the site, how wet it is, um, how it's been managed, um, all those sorts of things. So that's that's really useful, and you can add these secondary codes to your map. So just in one map, mm -hmm. you can get an awful lot more information. Um, you could take a, you know, you can uh, classify habit down, habitat down to level five, uh, which is quite detailed in the hierarchy, and also add um, a range of secondary codes just to add add inf information in about that. Uh, that mm. particular area of habitat. Um, and the other thing that you can do is as soon as the primary habitat changes or the, the, um, the secondary codes change, you can draw a new polygon. So differentiate different areas, which may be the same primary habitat, but which may have different characteristics. So one area might have scattered trees, the other may, may not. And you can actually show that on the map uh, much more easily than you would have, would have been able to before. So uh, the whole system allows you to add a great deal more detail than you would have been able to previously using phase one, for example. Great. And this is going to be in terms of its application then. So it's more fit for purpose in terms of, well, it's not just for planning and development, or is it just for planning and development uh, reasons? You know, it it's, adds to also the, obviously, the classification of different habitats, but also linked in with that these biodiversity net gain maybe baseline surveys that we need to be undertaking or will be undertaking a lot more in the next few years really yeah i think so i think it can really be used for a whole variety mm -hmm. of uh, of purposes at different scales as well um and interestingly for, uh, going back to secondary codes there are a whole lot of secondary codes for green infrastructure so if people are doing urban surveys um they can add in a lot more information about um uh, you know, features in, in the urban mm. environment as well, which is, which is really good. So, um, yeah, and as we said before, it actually underpins biodiversity net gain calculations. So uh, all those calculations are based on UK habitat classification um, habitats. Yeah. So um, if you carry out a phase one habitat survey, you would need to convert the phase one habitat into a UK habitat um, classification first, so you might as well start off using, um, you know, UK HAB and, and, and get yeah. your head around that. I guess. Yeah, I think it, I think it's you're absolutely right. I think we either you know if we are already using you know sorry if we're if we're using phase one at the moment, I think we need to do you know complete that transition uh, really uh, yeah. to, to to enable us to yeah provide you know better outputs really um, for biodiversity again or whatever sort of services we're actually providing. Yeah. Now, now you uh, you mentioned that this is like a, it's, it's a new system, so you know a few years old. We're into it now. So you say it's not perfect. Um, so what sort of um, you know what are sort of the advantages or you know challenges or disadvantages of using UK HAB over any other classification system at the moment? Yeah, um, just having used uh, uh, used it in the field a few times, um, there are some um, practical challenges. I think. Um, one of them is just simple because there are so many habitats now it's it's that much more complex particularly if you're um you're surveying down to level five in the hierarchy and you've got um several hundred um i think there are about uh, 1200 odd secondary codes that you can pick from <laughs> you know how do you remember all of those mm -hmm. uh and and that that's a challenge in itself because with phase one you got to know the habitats and the codes for those habitats so that in itself can be quite challenging to start with um there are ways around it of course um you could take a spreadsheet into the, the spreadsheet into the field with you on on a perhaps on an electronic device or print it out um 
UK Hub do offer um, uh, an app now, which allows you to quickly um, classify and map habitats, which cuts yeah. things down. Mm -hmm. um, you do have to pay for that. There's a subscription fee. Um, you can actually design your own system using um, a, a mapping app, which is something that I've done using a, an app called QField, uh, which works quite well, which allows you to quickly select habitats. So there are ways around that. Um, so that's one of the challenges. Um, another one that I can think of is that um, it's great that you've got um, a range of secondary codes to choose from to add information about a habitat. Um, but the challenge is when you come to actually produce a map, um, if you uh, if you add all the secondary codes as labels on your map, it mm -hmm. becomes very messy and crowded. So you need to think about a way of actually representing that information as part of the map, which is more challenging than a simple, straightforward habitat map, I guess. So that that that's a key a key challenge. Um, and again, there are ways around that, but they're you know it's a little bit clunky, really. Um, so those are some of the, the, the issues that I've come across. Um, and I think a little bit more thought needs to go into some of the habitats as well. So for example, the one I've been struggling with is um, uh, tall herbs. So the, uh, the instructions for classifying tall herb vegetation is that you choose uh, a primary code. Now there isn't a primary habitat tall herbs, what you have to do is choose, um, say, neutral grassland as your primary habitat and add in a secondary code to say that it's tall herbs. But it's such a common habitat, mm -hmm. why not have, uh, you know, uh, the primary habitat as being tall herbs? And it's, it's, it's little things like that, which I think need a little bit more thought, perhaps. Um, and simple things like... Um, uh, linear features in in the countryside like uh, um, hedgerows and uh, well, no, hedgerow is probably not a good example, but a fence, for example, there isn't a primary habitat or code for a fence. You have to use secondary codes, and it it all gets a little bit messy. So um, there are things like that 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 perhaps need ironing out. But right. but generally, um, yeah, I think I think it's definitely a step forward. Um, I, I, the other issue for me, really, is that if you um, if you have a look at some of the SAIM guidance on um, uh, guidelines for ecological appraisal and um, ecological impact assessment, um, the UK have classification systems really only given a passing mention. They still refer mm -hmm. to phase one. Um, and I may be wrong here, but to my knowledge, the country agencies haven't really formally adopted UK HAB yet. So um, I think there's a, you know, there those are barriers to it being adopted more widely. Um, so you've got the the paradox of um, uh, the UK HAB underpinning and um, uh, biodiv the biodiversity net gain calculations, which are you know, becoming a, a legal requirement for develop for development, but yet it hasn't been the the UK habitat classification system hasn't been formally adopted by the country agencies, or in fact by SAIM. You look at SAIM mm -hmm. documents, and they they don't really say you know this is the the system that you should be using. So um, I think that needs to happen before it becomes more widely uh, accepted and, and adopted. Um, and also, as we said before, that people are still, clients are still saying, please carry out a phase one or an extended phase one habitat survey. Yes, yes. Um, so you either do that or you turn around and say, well, actually, we prefer to do this, which is, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's more up to date and more fit, you know, it's fit for purpose. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm but sure that, I'm those sure. sorts of issues. Yeah, I'm sure there will still be a, a little bit of a, you know, a, you know, clients sort of education. You know, I think that's that's a, that's always going to be an ongoing, uh, uh, yeah, ongoing part of what we do, uh, really. So, uh, I mean, it's it's amazing that people actually know about phase one uh, habitat. So rather than just saying I need an ecological assessment, you know, or an, it, yeah. assessment, maybe even grand term as well for some of some <laughs> some some uh, some uh, of our clients, should we say? Um, yeah. So in terms of then. Um, just conscious of our time, uh, Paul. So, in terms of using this habitat, 
the habitats classification system. And I, I do prefer to use it, as you say, UK HAB. It's easy to say. <laughs> so what can people do maybe today if they've never actually accessed the UK HAB before? Um, so how can they start to improve their knowledge, understanding and skills in, in this uh, area? Yeah, so um, I think the first thing I would do is go onto the UK HAB Limited uh, website, um, just Google that, um, and you can download all the resources. And it's probably worth reading through the user manual, which is really, um, it's not too long, and it, it gives you a nice overview of the, of the system. Um, and, you know, have a flick through the Habitat Definitions Handbook. That's pretty useful as well. Um, the UK Hab Limited and SIME do offer uh, training courses on, um, on UK Hab. Yeah. There, are, there are two, as far as I know, there are two options available. Um, one is uh, a practitioner's course. So this is for experienced surveyors. And it's, it's like a conversion course, I guess. So people that, you know, are very experienced at carrying out um, uh, phase one surveys or NVC surveys. So it's just getting their heads around the classification system. They don't need to be taught about habitats. And there's also, um, so that's a one day course. And I believe there's an introductory course as well for people that are new into the profession and haven't had much experience carrying out surveys. So that's taking them from, um, yeah, uh, fr from scratch really to so that they can understand the system fully. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess the other the other thing that people need to consider is, um, you know, their, their own botanical knowledge because to carry out a UK HAB survey, or in fact, any kind of habitat survey, a certain level of botanical knowledge is required. So, you know, there are courses available. I believe you offer some, um, Richard, and, um, uh, yeah, there's no substitute for going out and practicing, to be honest. No. Um, you know, a course is all very well and it will point you in the right direction, but you've got to get out there and, and, and give it a go and, and practice and, and, and use a key for yourself. The best way of learning is to actually work things out for yourself using a, using a key. Yeah, great. And, and what I'll do, I will put a link to the, the UK Hub there and so people can download the resources from the, from the show notes within this um, podcast themselves. Absolutely right, you know, about um, obviously, you know, the UK have that uh, courses and science courses there. Uh, and yeah, botanical skills. You now, we, we, we can all improve our botanical skills no matter what level we are. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, we can say, I mean, the general populace, I'm sure we can do a little bit better than just identifying a daisy. <laughs> but uh, when you, I think, you know, if we're going to work towards that level, you know, that's um, those levels three, four within the UK hub those botanical skills are going to be crucial. And I think, you know, people can sort of, I mean, in one way, if you're entering into our profession, um, it's a, I think it's a great opportunity to skip phase one and go straight onto UK HAB. You know, you can forget about that, uh, that, that older system and um, just go straight into learning about this new one. But botanical skills is going to be the fundamental part of any of these classification systems. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think it's... Um a skill set that's um, to an extent missing within uh, certainly some consultancies. You know, there has been this uh, through no fault of their own, there's, there's been this, in my view, overemphasis on a few protected species as though that was the sum total of British wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not. Um, so, yeah, the habitats, botany and, uh, you know, a range of other species that aren't necessarily protected. Uh, are really important so yeah yeah no i think we, we covered on this podcast before you know, about um well obviously you know about bryophytes um but we include also you know uh, fungi as well you know that the all important parts of that i suppose we, we're talking about this holistic ecology you know that the, the whole ecosystem um, as the, in, in their right rather than actually as you say individual habitats or individual species so, so we need to, to to have a to take into consideration um yeah, yeah but Paul, thank you so much for your time. Um, if people wanted to get hold of you and your training um, uh, aspects, um, um, uh, well, I'll put this also in the show notes, but um, what was the name of your company again? Um, yes, I'm Salix Ecology. I am a uh, sole trader, so Salix Ecology is, is just me, but uh, yeah, yes, you're obviously welcome to get in touch anytime.
And it's uh, yeah, but it's mainly you're not fully you don't do protect the species yourself. It is it is really a surveying for um, yeah, botanical yeah work really. Yes, yes. My my interest is in uh, uh, yeah botanical work, habitat surveying, um, and uh, yeah, I'm quite interested in GS GIS mapping. GIS mapping too. Yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah. So don't come to, don't go to poor for your bat surveys. I think that's no. pro- that's right to say, isn't it? Really. No, please please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, Paul Lossick, thank you so much for joining me on today on the Ecology Academy podcast. That's a pleasure. Thanks very much, Richard. If you enjoy our show and want to help, then please click on the subscribe button and rate us on your favourite podcast player, as that's how you can inspire ecologists in the making, help retain great talent and provide insights of our industry to a much wider audience of why ecology really does matter. Thank you. Thank you.